Welcome to the Smart Driving Cars podcast. We appreciate you taking the time with us. This edition is sponsored by the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. For more information, head to MOTOETF.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with the Faculty Chair of Autonomous Vehicle Engineering at Princeton University, Alan Kornhauser. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. Joining us in this edition is Olaf Sackers of the venture capital firm Maniv Mobility, who wrote an interesting piece in Medium titled, Is Tesla a Tech Stock or a Fashion Product? Thanks for joining us, Olaf. Thanks for having me. Well, you're a partner in Maniv Mobility. You're also a Princeton product. So tell us what the thinking is behind that question. Is Tesla a tech stock or fashion product? Well, obviously Tesla is the, maybe the hottest stock uh, right now that, that everybody kind of wants to talk about and think about. Um, and so I think there are these dynamics of you know, popularity and, and chasing things happening in the market um, which kind of raised this question of, you know, why are, why are people investing in this? Is this just an example of what's called the greater fool's theory because it's going up? People expect it's going to go, keep going up and, and are bidding it up. And some factors kind of tied to that, the, 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 the growth of retail investing with, with uh, tools like Robinhood. Um, and, and then also this kind of status symbol attached to, to Tesla, which I kind of compared to like a handbag. You know why? Why do people want to own Tesla stock? It might just be. It might be more than just the retail investing. But as retail investing becomes more popular, the act of owning Tesla um, is also, you know, something that that t- tells other people about you or that makes you feel good as a retail investor because it's a hot stock. It's like the Amazon of our times, um, or or Apple, and you can kind of brag to people in in ten years time that you own Tesla back then and you kind of rode this wave, etc. So I think there, there are a whole lot of dynamics like that that are playing out um, in terms of Tesla stock. Um, but even if you buy this theory that you know th- there's something about having Tesla that makes you you feel something, um, the, the question again is is why? What what about Tesla makes it fashionable or, or a good product? So um, I think that kind of begs one question. But it might just be that that these are you know these are transitory. Phenomena. So, what I what I think from an automotive perspective, from a from a deep perspective, if if Tesla is this thing that in ten years time you're going to own and, and feel really special for having owned, what is the explanation for, for why that might be the right bet rather than this, this is just a, a fad, a fashion? You know, this, you remember those fidget spinners? Um, they, they were they were popular at one at one point, and then you know everybody just forgot about them. But there was Pet a rock, when, Pet Rock, uh, Hula Hoop. There have been num. Um, you know, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon cards, like yeah. they're, they're, you can you can just list lots and lots of things that, I mean, they they basically like fruit fly populations. Like there's a huge competition, you know, and 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 they and they breed a lot and then go up and then at some point they just run out of energy and like they all die off, right? So, I mean, that's definitely like my my memory of the fidget spinner craze is like everybody needed to have one until suddenly everybody forgot about it and then, you know, they're just a memory. Um, but, but there are two fashion items here. There's the stock and there's the car. Mm-hmm. They're they're both fashionable. I'd say there's three that, probably, Alan, because you've got Musk, the legend, the guy. Yeah, and you can, have Musk, who, the legend who can on there too. Do things with in, in space sense, that nobody else has ever done. Yeah, in a sense, it's basically one, becoming religion now. There's a trinity. <laughs> uh, yeah, and there might even be more because you have the boring <laughs> company. And the, and you have the, the boring cars, company, right? and you have the you have the. There may be a holy mackerel. Uh, <laughs> Elijah may be there too. You know, oh my goodness, we might have four, five, six, or seven of them. And some golden calves on top of it. Oh no! <laughs> so, so, so the, the thing, yeah, the fashion product part of it, I think, is really like the if you if you take it as a trinity, it's like the Holy Ghost part of the equation, right? It's this thing that kind of is ethereal and ha- hangs over Tesla, but like you know, the, the, these agencies that like rate different brand values, and like it's always Apple on top, and then Google number two. There is something about brand value, um, and Tesla Absolutely. has that. And, and it's it's a very subtle kind of feeling that people have when they approach it, but there's something about brand that people want to associate with themselves. I mean, there's all this kind of, 
history of brand and how brands emerged over time in order to differentiate products. But they kind of have this kind of quality of all these different narratives that combine into how people think about them. That that's quite powerful. So they, they make you feel aspect. good. They make you feel good. They make you special. My Patek Philippe. Oh my goodness. I mean, whatever. Um, oh, Apple, of course. Apple products. People will do all sorts of irrational product, irrational things for, for Apple products. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, in a sense, it's it's really, it's it's kind of amazing how it's it's evolved. But it had, to me, I think it has a lot to do with the whole customer experience associated with with Tesla that is really completely different than you know than Mercedes Benz treats me with my Mercedes. I mean, you know, I buy one and as soon as I buy one, as soon as I get out the out of the dealer, they're telling me how much crap it is, come in and buy a new one. I mean, you know, as opposed to to the whole the whole thing that's been put around this product as really I don't know if the intention was to make it into a fashion statement or that kind of thing, but but uh, but my goodness, seems like that's where it is, Olaf. Yeah, so I think, um, and I say this towards the end of the piece. Um, so I, I use this kind of structure in the piece where I present these two theories. The first is this handbag theory, and then go into the technology. Um, and, and kind of use the, the first theory as like a counterpoint to the second one. But, you know, at, at the end, I, I go back to this idea of storytelling um, because there's, there's a fundamental difference more so I think in, in storytelling than in underlying technology. Although I think there are also important differences in, in underlying technology between Tesla's and, and other car brands, like you mentioning your frustrations uh, with, with Daimler and, and others. Um, but I think almost the the most telling difference is is how they how they are able to communi communicate to their audience and and kind of tell the story, um, and you see this reflected in the stock prices of of every other car maker. Whereas Tesla, I, I mean, an inflated multiple for an industrial company would be an, a, a gross under exaggeration <clears throat> in describing Tesla's uh, pricing right now. But the, but the OEMs um, and even the suppliers, the car makers and suppliers have um, have discounted multiples like it's it's like day and night how how stark the, the difference is um and, and in that sense it's like they can't really get off the ground in terms of storytelling you know it's like uh like a political candidate that like just never takes off and, and can't explain versus one that's you know very charismatic and and communicative and and, and the fight is kind of lost in that sphere as well um but but the focus of the piece was was actually to try and tell the story about network architecture um, in vehicles, which I think, you know, people talk around cars, but they don't really talk, you know, and they, and they say things about technology on a high level, like Tesla's over their software updates. But I think the the real kind of questions are around what's happening to the underlying computer architecture of cars to enable these things, because unless you have that change happen, um, you can't really enable all this technology. And then tying this back to this idea of you know, what makes Tesla feel magical and, and have this brand allure, et cetera. You, you can't separate it from this, you know, sense that the technology is constantly improving, constantly getting better, that there's this kind of um, wave behind it. And that wave is built on this kind of sense of digital disruption on technology on constant improvement uh, through software. Yeah, but but it, I think it even goes beyond that because not only they're improving, Daimler's been improving, GM's been improving. The problem is that they never put the mechanism in there to let the customer improve as the whole thing was improving. The the, the whole over the air update has has been miraculous to me for for Tesla because they then embrace their their customers and says we're going to bring you along as we come along as opposed to making you go in trade in the old one to get a new one to go get it i mean fundamentally different and if you and 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 then the technology has also been very good you know autopilot is probably not as good as gm's super cruise Okay, yeah, I mean, probably that, not. That, what the hell has GM right? done with that? They've yeah. sat on it for two years. I mean, they, they have on there, you go to Super Cruise GM and they talk about 5 million miles driven with Super Cruise. 
holy hell, that means that in two years, they probably only sold 5,000 of those suckers. Okay, they, they don't put out any uh, that they've sold. They haven't done anything with it. And they, they hide it and instead of putting it out there. And, and, and it's, a, it's, it's like night and day. I mean, it's, it's it, to making it a fashion statement of, you know, one of these luxury products that you can actually, um, it makes you feel good because you own it. Well, there's, there's another, Go ahead. There's another thing that's that's important, I think, between these companies um, that I talk about a little bit, which is the difference in culture. Um, and Tesla has both kind of a, a much more, uh, I think, clear decision making structure. Like Musk really is a, is a micromanager and makes a lot of decisions, so can act faster. But it's also willing to take way more risk uh, than than other car makers, and and that's why I think you're seeing. GM very careful with the rollout of Super Cruise and also why a lot of these other products, I think um, and it's not just Super Cruise, I think are, are maybe better ADAS experiences because they've been rolled out carefully by the car makers with better driver monitoring, um, et cetera. And Tesla's kind of taken a lot more risk there. And I mean, if you remember that first um, Tesla fatality, like they were- Joshua really Brown. About what, yeah, yeah, Josh Brown. And, and the real questions about you know, what he was doing when he crashed, what would happen as a result. There was an ITSA investigation. Um, and, and Tesla kind of got through that. And, and now it just looks like, you know, people continue to die in, in autopilot crashes and people kind of shrug their shoulders now because it's been normalized. Um, but from his, from the standards of, of car makers, Tesla is just willing to take a lot more risks um, than, than others. Um, and that also means that they can roll out technologies faster. And I think that's a structural advantage, but part of my point about culture and the piece is all the advantages that you get from being a car maker through culture historically, are all the things that I think kind of hamstring them now. Um, so, you know, reliability, you know, hierarchical structure, you know, very process oriented, make it very, and, and you know, there's this kind of like um, a uh, SVP for every ECU, like the org chart reflects the structure of the vehicle. So when you digitize this whole thing and you make it software definable rather than kind of divide it into these very clear domains, I think you really mess with the, the org structure of these companies. Um, and you're seeing a lot of tension inside these, these companies. You know, who's responsible for what? If you take one person and, you know, you've got several different parts of the organization, you're saying everybody has to kind of report to this person, you've got more of a matrix structure. Um, or you've got different brands that used to have independence in certain points and you're saying, well, we need to do the digital development centrally. Um, and, you know, three brands all lose their authority on this thing and it, it moves to the center of the brand. Then, then you're going to have tensions and, and pushback, like I point out, happened recently at, at VW um, with uh, Christian Zenger being ousted. So. Yeah, and you look at Ford. I mean, Ford, you know, three uh, CEOs in six years. I mean, what the hell's going on there? I mean, I, I think I think I think Jim Farley is a, a really uh, interesting character. I mean, like, I, I don't think they actually have such high turnover. If you if you look at you know Tesla executives reporting to Musk, yeah. they last like eighteen months tops, right? Like, yeah, it's no, a they, they have like, yeah, yeah, they, it, it they, seems, they, yeah. It seems like being like a Theseus ship of like executives just churning in and out and just replacing the planks as you go along and having a new ship works perfectly well if you want to be Tesla, right? Um, so I, I wouldn't worry so much about what I think for the for the fact that there's a new CEO. I think I think I've, I've met Jim Farley. I think he's yeah um, he's both a car guy and he understands the company and will be able to work in the culture, um, but also understands I think the threats of of digitization, but the yeah. full value of the Ford brand. So. I think he's going to be a little bit controversial internally. Like, I think he's a bit of a, he'll, he'll do what he thinks is right, but not necessarily always the thing that's so political, but you kind of have to take those risks in these times, because if you just go along with what everybody's comfortable with, uh, you're going to lose. So what are your thoughts about what the GM announced uh, this week, unveiling the uh, Cadillac Lyric SUV? Uh, they're saying this will be a truly hands-free uh, driver assistance experience. They're not, they're not going to go on sale until late 2022, which, which I guess tells you something. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the OEM product update cycle challenge. And Tesla has been able to push, you know, new autopilot hardware in 2016 
into their vehicles and just kind of flip a switch and, and that kind of happened. Um, it's been able to ramp up new vehicle models relatively quickly. Like the Cybertruck was unveiled, what was it, last year? And, and they're talking about starting to manufacture it already. So there's a sense, and it's also because their portfolio is quite small. So as they make new vehicles, it's it's much more of a sense of like, we're expanding the Tesla offering by like a full, you know, 30% or 25%. Um, and if you count for the size of the Cybertruck, then it's even more. Um, so um, so that's the one challenge for, for, for brands like GM is the the update cycles are slow. It takes a long time to engineer a vehicle um, and to and to validate the systems. And I think this ties into the software network architecture kind of question. Like if everything is entangled in this web of kind of ECUs and, and uh, CAN bus, um, then it, and, and then you need to validate the systems and make sure that each ECU can is compatible with others. And if you have an 8S feature that it's kind of locked down and, and not going to interfere, interfere with things, you need to lock in the design a long time in advance. Um, that I think is part of what makes it quite slow to push new products. And this is in two years time, but this is the announcement, which means two or three years ago, they started designing and, and, and creating this vehicle. So, you know, this, the, the silicon inside the vehicle is gonna be from like, you know, smartphones two years ago. That's kind of the best you have on offer and you're gonna have lower resolution cameras if you have, you know, something facing inside the camp or, or, or things on the road. <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Every, every aspect of technology is baked in a long time in advance. And what I think you, where I think you need to get to is where you more and more decoupling the software and the hardware update cycles, making things more modular and, and able to increase the kind of clock speed of, of innovation in which you're able to add things quickly. And if you look at smartphones and how many generations of smartphones have been put out since 2007, you know, that's like, there've been two or three vehicle models in the same time and, and yet smartphones have completely transformed because the update cycles are much faster. So I think that's, that's one thing to say about the Lyric is that, um, you know, the two years away uh, and, and we have the same thing with OTA only coming now, like the new in 2014 that Tesla was pushing out uh, OTA updates and, and yet it's taken them almost, you know, a decade to, to bring vehicles to market um, that, that can, can be feature compatible. That said, um, I think GM's GM's actually one of the most interesting car makers right now um, because they've got this this new Altium platform. Adam Jonas um, was lo was joking that the company should just rename itself Altium um, <laughs> on the on the investor which is, I mean, it's a it's a kind of decently cool sounding name. It's better than Cruise and Super Cruise. Um, you know, Cruise being the the advanced you know, startup that's doing like full autonomous uh, systems and you'd think Super Cruise would be even better, but it's just their ADS system, right? But for whatever reasons, historically, like they ended up with these two names. Um, so I, I think the LTM platform is really interesting. And I think Cruise as a, as a technology vendor within the GM, uh, within GM, because it's kind of like a separate company. And you've seen this also with Argo, like how do you structure incentives for high quality talent? So you've got this kind of separate structure, but it's part of the GM family, um, which is, I think, creating really interesting uh, innovation. Um, like it's one of the, the, the leading players in terms of uh, autonomous vehicle technology. You have Dan Ammon, the, the president of the company, going over there in order to lead this unit, you know, giving a clear signal that this is a key part of the future of the company. Um, and, and you've got like in both cases, both with, with Cruise and with um, Altium, the, the battery platform, um, that they want to build all these different models on top of this kind of vehicle platform. Uh, you got this signal uh, from from Honda that they're investing in both of those uh, parts of, of GM's long-term roadmap. And you've, you, you've got this question like, will car makers like Honda that are the small and can't invest ultimately merge with, with the GM, but definitely you've got these kind of alliances for technology, both on the, on the battery EV platform and on the AV long-term you know, tech uh, investment. So how, how do these clusters kind of become stronger and, and the investment grow over time? I think that's, that's a really interesting trend to watch in the industry. Oh, love, I have a question, maybe a little bit on this. Why didn't GM continue along the Volt approach? The I mean, Volt, rather. You know, I mean, I for some reason I I always I happen to like the Volt approach because because in fact to me it looked like a uh, a locomotive. 
you know here you have um, here you have uh, you need a you need an energy source and uh, might as well use a, a, a small, very efficient uh, internal combustion engine of, of some variety to create the electricity then, that then allows you to have a, a powertrain that is just so much better than transmissions and so on and so forth um, uh, and big internal combustion engines. And, um, and, and I, I, I was, I'm, I'm surprised that, that, you know, they evolved that a little bit, and then you know that um, sapien line <laughs> may just terminate it. Uh, do you have any? Have, have you spent any time thinking about that one or at all, or what happened uh, there? I, I don't have deep insights of, about the the fault. I've I've driven a one definitely impressive work of of engineering. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I think kind of the question with hybrid architectures is how well they transition into into full EV um, because I think it's pretty but, clear that but do you need to go uh, my question is do you need to go to full EV I mean in a sense uh, you know the part of the full EV business has has to do with getting uh, sufficient battery mass in there to, so that you don't have the range anxiety issue. And but, that's but, a lot of stuff that you're carrying around on, on, on your back. Um, uh, and uh, when somebody actually looks at it in detail, it's not very pretty. Okay, and environmentally and a whole bunch of other things associated with it and resource wise, but um, you know, whatever. But, it, but I think um, my experience of, of the, the Volt is that it didn't have such great range um, and it didn't have such a large fuel tank, right? So you kind of in this in-between situation from, from a user experience where it's like you have to deal with, you know, a vehicle that, that doesn't like, you can drive it in, in EV mode, but you're eventually switching to, to, the, to the gas um, uh, powered uh, pod at some point so you're you're getting this kind of unsatisfactory as EV opposed, as, as and an unsatisfactory just, yeah internal combustion yeah. Yeah. And, and i think that that's maybe th there's this kind of user user challenge look the, there are lots of challenges with evs because like you point out they're heavy and we've built evs the same way we've built normal cars right so <clears throat> you can you can have e-bikes and you can have micro cars and things like that that you know work much better with with evs because um uh, because at a, at a lower lower weight that you're pushing then you can get uh the the return on uh investment or the unit economics to make sense sooner we're getting to the point where now we're getting to ranges where people are comfortable uh driving evs and at some point i think it's going to become absurd um that you don't really need to drive like 800 you know kilometers on on an EV and like why why do you have so I mean it's it's strange yeah, yeah, that people yeah. my partner Mike who is is involved in Battle Place like points out like it's very strange that all the the Tesla like people choose the highest range Teslas even though they're paying ten thousand dollars more but if if you wake up in the morning every single day and this is the advantage of EVs you wake up every single morning and you have a full tank of gas and and really like who's driving six hundred miles ever. Right, so yeah, uh, yeah. like you do, you do but it is a fashion a statement. It's 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 my purse, baby. You know, <laughs> and you can it's see a, it. <laughs> it's like it's like a it's like a fashion <laughs> statement that you really have to go out of your way to show people because it's like inside the vehicle, right? Ooh, like, it's only, but if you only, only knew what involved. was, <laughs> and and then Tesla Tesla as a result, like I think provisions all these batteries in all their vehicles and just like unlocks through software more so it's, it's like more you're, range. You're, baking, you're baking you're baking in all the inefficiencies of carrying the weight and you're just making software definable so uh, uh, yes <laughs> but, but anyway it's, it, it seems it seems to be working for him for, for the moment anyway <laughs> It, it's uh, everything seems to be working right so i think so the the tesla stock Look, there's, there's ways you can you can justify uh, the price of the stock, et cetera. And I tried to create a story, I think, that that, that tells a long-term story about why Tesla really can be dominant and, and grow. But the stock is priced to perfection. And I think you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, Musk has been on quite a run. And it's not just a Tesla run. It's a SpaceX run. It's a boring tunnel run. 
it's a you know not getting sued by the FTC for a good twelve months kind of run. And, and yeah, the, uh, the boring company just got the green light to expand its Las Vegas it. route with Tesla vehicles. So that's moving forward for them too. And and I mean I I find it kind of just weird that you're digging a tunnel for cars and like that's innovation. But like there's something about once it's got the Tesla brand attached to it, and as long as you've got Tesla vehicles in the tunnel, like heaven for fun that you should put like you know a a, a Peugeot in that tunnel or, or a I mean, um, or GM vehicle Cadillac. Look, um, the, we put two guys in space, and what do they go to the rocket ship in? Teslas. Yeah, yeah. All dressed and, in white looking. I mean, can you imagine? Man, my handbags started looking so great when they when that when when that happened. This is, I mean, this is this is the storytelling. This is the storytelling. I mean, this is what what Musk is is amazing at. They got a designer to design the space suits, right? And like, you got people, you got people obsessing over these space suits because they look very fashionable, but they're practical. And I think this kind of combination of like fashion and practicality is exactly what the spaceship spacesuit embodies, right? Yeah. Like if, you, if you're if you a techie, you can geek out about all the ways in which this is a better spacesuit than other spacesuits. And if you're a fashionista, you can go, well, <laughs> look how cool it looks. And that's kind of the Tesla itself. Like the vehicle has like all this functionality, but it also looks good. And they've been able to marry these two things, I think in a way that other car makers can't and then tell a story about it. And then well, look, well, look, over the look, last the, week, the, yeah. the, the other thing is, you know, SpaceX a couple of days ago did a night launch of, of uh, Starlink and then, of course, brought the damn thing back at night and for maybe the first time had full coverage of the whole damn thing landing on the on that platform out there in the ocean in the dark. You know, I mean, it was like gorgeous <laughs> and he's putting all those satellites up there. And he's going to provide high-speed internet around the world. And when he does that, holy hell! I mean, my handbag is going to look even better, <laughs> isn't it? Not only that, he got the SpaceX uh, astronauts back safely, and and uh, then yeah, which... <laughs> on top of everything, this contract with with the Pentagon. Oh, and then SpaceX wins it, you know, puts its nose in the tent of, of, uh, of the probably the, the, the most closed military industrial complex thing that nobody's put their new has put their nose in that tent since before World War Two, all of a sudden, they get 40% of the launches out of SpaceX, all this stuff. Oh, my goodness. I mean, this, the, 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 the the enhancement of the brand, which is, you know, one of the things that you're really pointing out there is, wow. Yeah, and, and I think there's, there's this ability to kind of dominate the narrative, which is, I think, both a, a reflection of, you know, how well, you know, Musk can be entertaining on, on Twitter and how the company because it has a vision and a direction. And look, we, we live in a world where I think we're, we're lacking leaders with vision. Um, what Musk has is, is, is a real story to tell about where humanity is heading. And you can scoff at the idea that we need to be an interplanetary species. I don't really see much benefit in like having a small outpost in Mars if the world were to be destroyed by nuclear weapons. Like, yeah, right. you know. how many of us are going to get there? I mean, you know. Yeah, but I also I don't see like why <laughs> yeah. why it really matters from yeah. like an existential perspective that there's a small outpost in Mars like once most of humanity. Like, but but whatever. The, the, he sees a point and he can tell a story about that, and people hear that story and are, are inspired, just like they're inspired by you know the tesla story of of revolutionizing transportation in a way that it becomes electric and you see that in the way that other automotive executives for instance talk about him like herbert deese the ceo of vw just put out a blog post and they kind of have to tip a hat to how he's pushed the industry forward and how he's and 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 that i think is is the most important concession that everybody gives to him which is you have a vision and we don't right? Nobody else has got a vision. And so if you don't have a vision, you can't control the narrative. You're not interesting. Um, everybody else has to come up with a vision for, for where they're headed and what it means to be, you know, uh, Ford in, in, in the 20, like 21st century. Like, where is this company going? What does it have to give to the world? It gave us lots of cars, but like cars are now kind of boring and commoditized. 
so what what can you tell us? What story can you tell us about who we are and where we're heading? And this is this is the the handbag side of the equation, but it ties into the technology side of the equation. They have to they have to be married. Um, and uh, and you don't see the the capability inside you know many of these the, the positioning and the the speed of innovation etc getting up like they all know and they they're all trying really hard to change these things but they're struggling but more importantly you also don't see that vision being explained and and described and um but but that said like tesla's been super lucky like in all sorts of ways like if you if yeah. you look like and and so i think there's also this sense of messianic inevitability that that goes when talking about tesla now and and i think that also drives the stock you know, but you could have been messianic about fidget spinners at, at one point. Um, like, d just like, and and this is the thing about narrative is like, you can turn around in a few times, a few years time and be like, oh, obviously it was a bubble. Obviously it was, was headed this way. Well, obviously Musk was going to just keep on pushing forward and, and driving forward, et cetera. Like we look back at Amazon and, and Apple and, and go, obviously, like what an idiot I was for not buying the stock in, you know, the, the mid 2000s or during the dot com bubble or whatever right like so there's this kind of uh what's it called um retrospective bias you know yeah I, I, 2020 i wanted to short tesla at 400 you know luckily i didn't <laughs> yeah or 600 or 800 oh no 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 not then but you know whatever <laughs> but hey uh no um it, it's wonderful Fred. Interesting insights, Olaf. And we'll continue in just a moment, but this is a good time to remind you about our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF, symbol MOTO. To get more info, you can go to MOTOETF.com. On the website, we should point out, it's a good idea to read the white paper they have there, the Smart Transportation Revolution. It's under the Insights and News tab. Lots of great information to help you make informed decisions. You may already know that ETFs are a way to spread risk with investments and focus on a, on a category of stocks. The site again is MOTOETF.com. Well, Alan, on the top in the latest Smart Driving Cars newsletter is Too Simple. A piece in the, the information recently was headlined, the biggest self-driving truck startup stumbles and hitting high goals. And those missed goals have to do with both money and technology. Your thoughts are maybe they set the wrong goals? Well, I mean, that's, I've been saying that for some time. I, I, you know, it might be nice to have driverless um, 18 wheelers out there, but my goodness, that, that's just not where we start with this, with this technology. I mean, why well, put those monsters out there to scare everybody that's, that's driving on the interstates? I mean, they would have to be so perfect and, and work so well uh, right out of the bat. Just doesn't seem to be the place to start. And the unfortunate thing is, is that the, the technology in, in the in the long haul trucking industry just isn't, uh, ha hasn't been promoted, I think, correctly. <clears throat> um, you know, driving a truck for 10 hours a day is an extremely difficult task. And what those trucks need more than anything is a safe driving technology or what we call what we call safe driving technologies other people want to call level one level two or whatever things that keep them from crashing the things that that sort of help that that commercial driver uh from uh, getting between rocks and hard places and dying i mean i mean just think fred if we had if we had to work 10 hours a day and be perfect that whole 10 hours otherwise we die to feed our families my goodness i mean what a job it's extremely hard and and too simple could be promoting that and selling that and that has roi to every c truck ceo i mean the, the expected liability exposure of each truck is greater than ten thousand bucks a year because of crashes this stuff can easily chop that in half and since most trucking companies are 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 self-insured it's really at least for the beginning part they you know they they buy some stuff from mike screwed at, at munich re or something for the for the big exposure 
managers, but that's all coming out of the CEO's pocket because of the self-insurance piece of it. And in fact, you could now really improve uh, the, the quality of the work environment, save drivers and have ROIs that easily pay for the technology to do that. And there's nobody out there really promoting that in, in the trucking industry. We shouldn't be promoting take a driver out of the driving, out of, out of the truck. That's just my view. But, but the re and, and I think the trend is actually the opposite. We have a lot of AV developers um, like Aurora recently and, and even Waymo to some extent now focusing increasingly on, on trucking as a use case. Um, but, it, but I think that the challenge, like I, I get your, your point, Alan, that, that you know, the, the emphasis should be on, on safety and, and that there's real things that can be done there and, and there's real risks around autonomous trucks. But the, the clear, the, the, the incremental savings you'll get from, from improving safety, maybe or reduce the insurance premium somewhat. We've seen with, 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 uh, with autopilot um, or, or even with you know, uh, advanced braking systems they, they don't necessarily work in every scenario and there's a risk of false positives or users misusing them. So you don't, I don't think you completely remove yeah, accidents. You create an incremental increase. Of increment. course you whereas, don't remove whereas, whereas if you, if you do remove the driver from the vehicle and then you kind of follow, like th there's a question of what the technology threshold in order to have this viable be, but you, you completely change the unit economics of trucking. And only that in the longer term, well, you, you change it because you don't have to pay drivers as much and and you and and because a large component of the cost is, is the driver but you also create the possibility for i think smaller trucks on on the highway which might be safer in, in the long run um and various other um improvements because the reason we have big trucks is because we have a driver shortage which is an extremely acute driver shortage and part of the reason you know you have many bad drivers is because there's a driver shortage and it's very hard to make sure that drivers drive well and give them the right incentives uh, to drive well, because they know they have leverage in this labor market. Um, and they also don't have many other options um, other than truck driving when, the, when they end up truck driving, because it's an undesirable job. Uh, like you pointed out, 10 hours a day, you know, in an uncomfortable seat, you've got high rates of sleep apnea and, and other you know, uh, bad, you know, bad. We won't even talk about, we reason. won't even mention and You don't even want to mention all the things that those poor guys and gals have to do to stay awake for 10 hours to feed their family. So we won't even go there. And of course we have big trucks because of the productivity of the driver, you know, yeah. because you see, you need to have at least one of them in there. And so that's there. And yes, we could go to smaller trucks, but darn it. Uh, 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 the, the collision avoidance systems, haven't been haven't been developed well enough and it was just a few worse problems than, than, than it, it, passenger vehicles in terms of update cycles abso like absolutely. seven years to design a new truck. absolutely and, and the technology is lagging behind and the whole concept you know just a few years ago was was not to have them actually operate it was just to warn you i mean they weren't even saying we're good enough hey we know things are bad or about to happen we're going to hit the brakes no 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 we're not sure we're just going to warn the guy and we're going to make sure that olaf you're you're responsible it's your nickel. We warned you. You crash. It's your problem. As opposed to going in there and really making these damn systems work so they don't have the false positives. So they, they do, uh, if there's an object uh, that is stationary in the lane ahead, they know the difference between it's a, it's a bridge abutment that you can go under or it's a tree that you can go under and not a fire truck sitting there. Look, the damn industry has to do a whole hell of a lot better job in that before they can even start thinking thinking about taking a person out of the out of the vehicle because then it has to be essentially perfect okay you know and i at think least Alan, in the beginning I, that's that's just my view on the damn thing but whatever go ahead alan i think there has to be a, a component of educating drivers as well about the technology because many of them if not most of them just fear the technology saying they're trying to take my job away yeah, well, uh, yeah. That, what course, you're saying course, is we're trying to make your job no, better, I th I th healthier. Well, well, I've argued that OSHA should be in here pounding the table saying, 
damn it, uh, trucking industry, you improve the work the work environment. This is not just a food processing plant where you you know you you've had you know dangerous situations and so on. This is a dangerous situation that that you uh, J B Hunt and and Schneider and U S Express and, and all the others that put truck drivers in improve that sucker. Okay. Uh, the ROI is there to do it, and and but it's not at all been sold by any of these companies. Too simple, uh, Peloton or whatever, or any of them they want to do, they they want to uh, platooning. I mean, get out of here. All right, next on the list. <laughs> next on the list, Uber this past week announced results for the second quarter, showing a decline of twenty nine percent year over year. One bright spot, I suppose, uh, while ride sharing had a big drop, food delivery more than doubled. And we all know why that's the case, I suppose. I don't know. I mean, yeah, great. I mean, look, in, 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 in the end, uh, Uber in, in, in the best of times had less than 1% of the, the trip market. Okay. They, they were essentially, you know, uh, they haven't been able to scale. They can't scale until until they they get the driver out of there. Uh, there are just so many people who want to be enslaved to go drive for free for Uber, and uh, once you start having to pay for them, uh, then the affordability where you are on the on the supply demand curve is uh, in basically a niche market. Uh, but um, hey, people, I guess that's another handbag that people are out there. Oh, fast. State. I just don't think it's very fashionable. I don't know. Olaf, <laughs> counter that. <laughs> I mean, uh, from a from a tech investing perspective, you know, some of the biggest businesses that have been built over the last decade have have been in in ride hailing, food delivery, um, etc. So there's there's obviously something you know a, a decent market there. You, you point out only one percent of trip miles. It's like trillions of trip miles. There's, there's lots of of market to expand into. And I agree, you know, autonomous vehicles would completely change <clears throat> unit economics for them. And, and, and I think most importantly, expand the, the, the trip market. Um, but it, th that said, I think there was a, uh, a clear direction in which both Lyft and Uber before this pandemic uh, hit were, were moving towards, you know, cash flow positive, you know, unit economics where they weren't losing money on, on every trip and, and that they could also afford the cost of the technology investments. Um, a lot of tech companies, unlike car companies, you know, in the, in the early weeks of, of COVID fired a lot of people, you know, basically cleaned up house and information has written a bunch about internal fights and amongst the CTO of Uber, et cetera. There's a lot of kind of pushback on, on this, but, these were huge engineering organizations and, and maybe a little bit of respect for, for the needs or, you know, the, you, you had uh, Bolt Taxify basically built something very similar to Uber uh, across Europe at much lower cost. So maybe they're, they're of respect and, and, and expensive beasts, but I do think that there is a big market that people very much value services like Uber and, you know, you just have to be in a place where you can't get Uber to be very frustrated that there, that there isn't an option. Uh, like that, um, for instance, in in Tel Aviv where I, where I live, uh, you can wait for a taxi, but at prime time the taxis will not go through the app get um, the local provider um, and will just pick people up street side and demand cash and, and screw them over. Whereas Uber is you know a reliable service that you know is transparently priced, etc. So you you know the thing that the, Uber is mainly an arbitrage on, on the taxi world, and it's much better than. I think what came before um, definitely challenges, but I think they will, you know, become positive. And, and the Uber Eats investment for them was pretty smart diversification. It turns out now, um, and uh, and I think that market is also going to improve in terms of unit economics. As you've seen in China, Meituan is 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 making quite a lot of money, and the stock prices has surged, etc. You're seeing consolidation in Europe with uh, Jet just eats takeaway, which just acquired Grubhub. Uber just acquired Postmates, so another. There's a new player and then, you know, three players overall rather than four players in the U.S. market. And the market's consolidated over time. So I think those companies will start making money. It will be less, there'll be less uh, cheap things for consumers. I don't know if you saw that article about the guy uh, with a friend with a pizza shop who was just like running an arbitrage on, on DoorDash that they were selling 
pizzas to themselves and making money. It's a great article if you, if you look it up. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Ironically, uh, Uber's own corporate employees aren't going to be needing to take Ubers. Uh, the company says they're going to be able to stay home and work through June of next year. So. That, yeah, yeah it's, uh, mean, it's what's happening in Silicon Valley. Right, and I right. think that <laughs> the trend towards telecommuting is going to be huge. It's huge. And the, the implications on land use, the implication on rent, the impl implications on commercial real estate, even the implication on home real estate, all of a sudden, you know, people are really going to buy homes that also have offices for them to work in at least in one sector of the of, of the market and the whole design of homes and all that sort of thing is is probably going to be impacted a bit by these kinds of things to to give each uber employee 500 bucks for for staying home for six months i mean holy hell they're making i mean i mean how much rent are they not paying how, I, what's the cost to to mm -hmm. to to put a, an employee in a building you know for six months in San Francisco, let alone in, in Wall Street. I mean, uh, Goldmine Sachs, I mean, geez, uh, why bring 3,000, 5,000 people to, to Wall Street? Um, geez, and they, they have to, some of them take New Jersey Transit or, or, or um, you know, Metro North and suffer through all that and then pay whatever, you know, 75, 85 bucks a square foot for office space. <laughs> I'll leave them home. I mean, geez. Uh, and the two two hours commuting time can be spent the time, uh, on I mean, those terminals. Oh my terminals. goodness! <laughs> and 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 why did they go in there? Was there so much, so many transactions going on at the water cooler that they all needed? A, we need to develop a virtual water cooler, you know, to put on Zoom or something like that. That uh, that will then grab that benefit. And um, and oh my goodness. Um, our friend uh, Kara Cockleman at the University of Texas, Alan, has co-authored a study, which you highlight in the newsletter, on shared auto automated vehicles, saying before they can be widely adopted, they're anticipated to be implemented commercially in confined regions or on fixed routes. I guess we're seeing some of that, where the benefits of automation can be realized. Yeah, I think, I think yes, uh, the, they're really looking at the utilization of shuttles. I just think that... Uh, that uh, really to to do driverless, then you just completely move away the convent from the conventional um, uh, urban transit sort of thing. You you no longer deal with corridors. You deal deal with areas. Uh, you deal with people going from A to B and all sorts of A to Bs anytime during the day. Demand responsive, basically taking the Uber Lyft type of models in some um, limited shared ride opportunities and and basically uh, going from anywhere to anywhere as opposed to the way that we've been with respect. No wonder nobody takes mass transit. I mean, you've got to, first of all, have a PhD in being able to read a timetable. And, you know, it only goes between a few points. So, uh, and then you got to transfer them. I have the hell with it. I buy a car and go and drive myself or whatever. The, I mean, that, the market places told us that that's why that's why they're you know less than four percent of the trips nationwide are taken on transit i mean you know and it's just a lousy 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 service except for a few places you know in which there are quarters to a few downtowns but the rest of the nation is basically anywhere to anywhere uh, that's where most of the 320 million people in the United States, uh, that's that's what they do every day. And and the issue is, is how do you address and provide mobility to those folks? And, um, and those folks that don't have access to a car, first of all, that's the most important one. And then after you do them, then expand that darn thing out to maybe serve me so that I can, you know, leave my cars at home. Well, where we do see, go ahead, where go we ahead, do see yeah. autonomous vehicles being deployed uh, actively is in closed environments for commercial use cases like forklifts in uh, warehouses oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, or in ports or mines or farms. Um, and it, I think those, I think those are, those are easy use cases. I think yep. the question yeah, is how, how do you, how do you limit the, the ODD, the, the complexity um, of the deployment? Um, while still having a good return on, on investment, at least for the initial use cases and then scale up from there. What we haven't seen is, you know, all these passenger vehicle projects or trucking projects 
get beyond a meaningful milestone. I mean, you you've been right. pointing this out since ever yeah. since I met you the first time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, pointing out that Waymo hadn't done a, a, a single drive without anybody in the vehicle. They did that since, but it was. You know, it's basically handful, being one. But just a handful. And where they do it, they did it in Chandler. Great. But I mean, talk about a lily white community that already has more cars and then knows what to do with. I mean, it's not really serving a mobility need. I mean, I, I really want these folks to come to Trenton, to come to places where, in fact, there is a, a mobility opportunity to provide some, some quality of life improvement to people who could actually use it and then grow from there. And, and to do it in community. Communities, uh, 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 communities, uh, not downtown San Francisco, certainly not Manhattan, maybe not even Brooklyn, but things like Trenton, which are, you know, places where people live. That's, you know, there are what, a thousand Trenton in, in, in the United States where, where you could replicate this darn thing and get it to work there. Where it's not tough, you don't have to go much more than 25 miles an hour, but you need a network that, that is area wide where people have, can access this thing and get to a hairdresser, or get to uh, go uh, maybe even grocery shopping or a library or to, to uh, hockey practice or whatever and and do the those fundamental things as opposed to this mindset of you know i have some you know guy in a tie who needs to go downtown to his office job that he's not even going to go to anymore never mind whatever <laughs> well olaf uh, it, it's a it's a pleasure having you on and uh alan always likes to highlight some of the the brilliant people coming out of princeton Here's a couple more uh, mentioned in the newsletter. Two Princeton grads, Adam Bragg and Lane Russell, have launched U Experience, the letter U, buying out hotels in Hawaii and Arkansas to offer college students a place to go instead of staying at home while taking remote classes. The price, $15,000 for Hawaii, $12,000 for Arkansas. And Alan's saying, why didn't I think of that? Oh man, I mean, you create the Princeton bubble in, in a hotel on the beach, you Orange know, in, 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 in Hawaii and just, you know, whatever. I don't, I mean, luckily um, our president said, don't bother coming here in the fall because we can't, we're just going to put you in jail. I mean, we're going to put so many restrictions on you and so on. And then if you, if you don't, if you break those restrictions, what are we going to do? Um, uh, are we going to whack you on the wrist or are we going to throw you out of school? I mean, we're not going to, there's no way that we can provide the, the college experience with the kind of, 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 of uh, Gestapo like constraints that we were going to put on these poor kids. So, I mean, you know, create a bubble in Hawaii, in the Caribbean, in Florida, whatever, Princeton bubble, have tigers, orange and black all over the place, whatever. And then you can zoom into my lectures and so on, whatever. I'm, what, what do you think, Olaf? I'm, I'm, <laughs> um, I, I, I think not so much for Princeton, but for other colleges, you know, it, it kind of feels existential with what's happening now with, with all this remote learning. Because yeah, you can do this, but why not just do Coursera classes uh, in your Hawaii or Arkansas bubble? Um, or take the best of, you know, you get, you get the best of the, the I mean, you can, you can watch you, but you can also watch like a great professor from Princeton. You don't have to stick to all the other boring yeah, Princeton, yeah. Princeton faculty if you're-, if you're uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, we're gonna try to make it so that it, it's more, you're absolutely but, but, right. But You're this absolutely is right. Digital, this is the problem of digital disruption, right? Is that you suddenly go from, you know, limited distribution. Princeton is a limited distribution channel. You have to be on campus and be exposed. And then you have this really powerful bundle because Princeton has a great student to faculty ratio. It's got really great uh, professors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you, when you open up to digital, you just get your, cho your choice of all the best professors. And you know, if you if you're going down the list to your middle tier colleges, they really have very little to offer. And your Hawaii bubble will be, you know, the nicest place to be. But you'll also have better education potentially if it's structured in in the right way. Like I think there are lots of challenges for for college age kids. Um, you know, even even at schools like Princeton, just staying focused and disciplined and 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 focusing on their classes, et cetera. 
which is why the on-campus experience can be helpful. Um, so I think you're probably going to have, you know, uh, skewed outcomes, which are going to just further, you know, all the challenges around inequality in this country. Yeah, well, but, we, um, we, but, but I, I just don't see how, you know, most universities are, are I, I feel like it's, it's really existential for them. I'm surprised they're not fighting harder to, to stay open. I think the risk groups among students, you know, the, the actual risk of, of COVID leading to, to bad outcomes for younger folks is, is, is very low. I think, you know, there has to be a real consideration of interactions with faculty or might be more, more at risk, but uh, I, yeah, yeah they, I'm they, kind they, of surprised how, how it's being accepted. They, they claim that they were trying to protect me because, you know, if I get this, I'm dead or something like that, they're saying. Uh, yeah. That's what my wife said, but whatever. And, and um, you know, it, I've heard you quite tell. You're, 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 you're absolutely right. But, but I think, and, but we've had the Coursera thing now for, for at least almost 10 years now, and somehow it didn't really grab. You know, university. You have, you have FaceTime and, and Google Hangouts for a long time too, right? Yeah, but now, yeah. now you have a pandemic and people are forced to transition, for, and, that, for, and that yeah. and that transition doesn't go back. It's it's you know it's like the tide; it comes out quickly and goes back slowly. I I, I hope it comes back. I, I you know I, I guess we'll come back I to like, some extent. Like people people will always want to go to I think a university like Princeton. Uh, they're, I hope they're so. Very, I mean, we very, are great, very, aren't we? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I got a lot of my out of my time at Princeton, but there there are many other universities with much you know that don't sit on I can't keep track twenty three billion dollar endowments that can you know Maybe plant 30. really nice trees and, and stuff like that. It depends whether they invested in Tesla, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Olaf, it's, Olaf it's, we really want to take a, a, the time to thank you for for coming on with us. It's, it's been terrific. Great insights. It's been great. Yeah. Great, to, great way to start my day yeah no it's it's wonderful thank you thank you the, we try to have a little bit of fun when we do all this there's a little tongue-in-cheek it is but it is a they're very serious subjects and um and i hope uh, our audience realizes that um, th there's a lot of thought here if we had real answers to all this uh i guess um we'd be so damn rich or whatever <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who knows where's the best place for people to to follow your work um, well, I think Alan might be linking to the article in his newsletter, but uh, you, on on our website, maniv.com, you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, if you go to Medium uh, and either search my name or, or search, you know, for Maniv, you'll find a bunch of our, our writing. Um, I think that's probably the best way. I use Twitter mm -hmm. occasionally, LinkedIn, right. things like that. And it's spelled M-A-N-I-V. And we should yeah, also point out that... Com. You also pointed out that you, you live in Tel Aviv, but that is not Tel Aviv we're looking at behind you. We shouldn't point that out. Well, it's just a virtual background. I'm in San Francisco <laughs> and I've been in San Francisco since March. Um, Mine's a virtual then... background too. No, 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 no. <laughs> not. One, one of my colleagues has a picture of our office that he uses as a virtual background <laughs> and it's the most confusing thing because he gets a real uh, kick out of it. Uh, Terrific. I always well, have to ask him, is he in the office or not? Because I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's in Hawaii. Before we wrap up, we want to remind you to check out the replay video or audio of last month's Driving the Debate on Amazon, Zooks, and beyond. Uh, the site is drivingthedebate.com. Keep an eye out there for, for more to come this month. Thanks to our sponsor, the Smart ETFs, Smart Transportation and Technology ETF. The ticker symbol for the ETF is MOTO. And for more information, go to MOTOETF.com. You can find us at smartdrivingcar.com, also on Anchor FM, Spotify, TuneIn, Apple, Google, Spreaker, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can get your smart speaker to play us too. You can find my tech reports at textination.com. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Alan Kornhauser. Thanks for listening or watching, and please stay safe.